Welcome to Transparent Conversations. My name is Katie Buckingham, and I'm our curator here at Museum of Glass. And I am completely delighted to be sitting digitally next to Josh Hirschman, who has graciously agreed to share his story and his artwork um, featured in our exhibition, Transparency, an LBGTQ plus glass exhibition. Uh, the show is the nation's first grouping of studio glass objects made entirely by the LBGTQ community. Uh, and it's a celebration of freedom and identity uh, and the em uh, emphasizes the importance of being transparent about honesty and transparent and honest about who you are. Uh, we have been partnering with the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia to make this exhibition happen. And we're so lucky to be the venue that gets to showcase it here on the West Coast. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that logged in today and to all of the artists in the exhibition, uh, and especially the exhibition curator, Megan Cole at the Liberty Museum. Uh, we wouldn't be able to have all these important conversations and do all this good work without you guys. So thanks for being here. Um, and I am so excited to introduce Josh and have a conversation with him today. Um, he is here to talk about what inspired his work and how he got involved in the exhibition. So uh, hello, Josh. Hello, everyone. Um, I To start things off, I would love to hear a little bit about how you became involved with transparency uh, and what it was like being asked to be included in uh, an exhibition that focuses on the LBGTQ plus community. Okay, well, I guess it came about because my friend Tim Tate kind of contacted me and encouraged me to submit. And uh, so I went ahead and did so and was just very excited that Megan, you know, brought me on board. And um, so that's kind of how I, I kind of knew about it. I was invited to apply, but once I got in, I have to admit, I kind of had a little case of imposter syndrome, was a little unsure if I would fit into the show, to be quite honest. Um, this sounds silly, but maybe I didn't feel quite gay enough to be in a show about um, these issues because um, my work isn't really about my sexuality and I wasn't quite sure how it would fit in. So I, I was a little intimidated. I wasn't quite sure if the theme of the show matched kind of the theme of my work. But then the more I thought about it, um, I thought that this is kind of silly and that um, it was really important for me to be involved in this show because I was pretty, um, I was a late bloomer. I didn't come out until my mid twenties and, um, you know, wasn't making work about sexuality, um, wasn't really um, involved in any uh, LGBTQ communities. I was just kind of doing my thing. And I realized that this was a really good opportunity for me to kind of um, not only like come out as a proud gay man to the glass world, which largely didn't know I was gay, um, except for my friends and family, you know, I wasn't really super out. Um, and so I kind of used this as an opportunity to kind of out myself and show that, uh, show some pride and also um, be involved in this incredible community that um, I wasn't involved in before. And so it ended up being super empowering for me. And I don't think the curators really expected this to happen, but it ended up being a growing experience for me to uh, be involved in this show and kind of realize that, you know, I, I can be proud, but not have to, you know, be like super involved, you know, um, I didn't have to be feeling inferior as if I wasn't gay enough. That all went out the window. And so the show really helped me kind of grow as a, as a gay person. So thank you, Megan. <laughs> I think that's really amazing. Uh, but we, um, when we were chatting earlier, I think that the thing that's remarkable about all the work in the show is that there's a, a common thread of empathy and seeing the world through the eyes of others, uh, which, you know, is is the subtitle to all of the work that you have in the show. Uh, so I would be really interested to hear how you selected um, capture and derealization, which are the works that represent you uh, and your story in the show and why you felt they were a good fit for a show like Transparency? Well, you know, 
Really, I, I selected this work because it was very personal for me. Um, and it was also quite, I thought, an interesting piece. Um, it was a, kind of the first time I had ever discovered that um, my sculptures could actually take images and take portraits. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put my most important piece out for such a show that was, you know, just an important show is going to be in a museum. So I just wanted to put my best foot forward. And, and this, this piece was that. This, I thought it was my best piece I'd made at the time. Um, and also it was very personal to me. So that's kind of why I selected this piece for the show. And, and just for everybody listening, when you say your work takes portraits, tell us a little bit more about what you mean. Okay. Um, would you like me to kind of share my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see some, uh, let's see the work up close. Uh, and since I'm checking the chat, Billy George says, woo, Josh Herman. Okay, thank you, Billy. Yeah. Okay, so says, hello, Billy. Here's my screen with you guys. Um, let's go. So here is the work in its original form. This was uh, 2014, 15, I finished this. Well, I was casting this camera here. This is a glass Roliflex and while I was cold working it, I realized that um, if I shined light in the front, it would project an image onto the back. There is a, um, you can see it's polished, but when I was cold working, it was ground down and it was much like a ground glass screen. So when I shined light through it, I saw an upside down reversed image appear on the back. And I had this aha moment where I realized that these cameras actually function. And so I worked with a photographer friend of mine who taught me how to create a system where I could actually capture images and um, on Polaroid film. And let me, sorry to scroll through. So here's kind of me isolating the outside of the camera from the light, um, kind of taping everything off, turning it into a pinhole camera. And then this is kind of the archaic looking um, functioning of the camera where I put a Polaroid backer on the back of the camera held on by rubber bands. And so I would use it like a pinhole camera and actually expose the image using a light switch. <laughs> and for many of these photos, I'd actually get people to come into a dark bathroom with me. And then I would click on the light switch for the exposure. So it doesn't get more archaic or old photo than that. Um, so, you know, here's a portrait um, of the person that you can see here. I believe this is Penny um, getting photographed in the um, bathroom at Washington Glass School. Um, Tim Tate was very nice to invite me down for an event there. And I, I wound up taking several portraits of collectors in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> which was hilarious. I don't think they were expecting that. Um, and I don't think they were expecting their portraits to wind up on the wall of the National Liberty Museum or the Tacoma Museum of Glass. This, this is how it's um, displayed at the museum. Um, I've taken it from a kind of grid format and uh, decided to kind of, with the encouragement from Megan uh, and Tim, I think, uh, to put it horizontally. Uh, so it read more as a um, story and you could kind of have a little bit more time and connection with each portrait. Um, so we can go more into this later. Um, maybe at the end of the lecture, I can show you more of the images um, so you can see kind of the quality and blurriness of them. Well, and, and that quality and blurriness has a special connection to you personally. Uh, do you want to jump in and, and talk about that? Yeah. Um, you know, it was real amazing that once I started exposing those images, I realized that it really um, mimicked the way that I see without my glasses on. I see double. I, things are very blurry. If, if I don't have my glasses on, I can barely recognize your face. I can't read. I'm still probably legally blind without my glasses on. So um, that was pretty exciting to me to see that these images kind of um, mimic the way I see. So um, I was I was born with a, a lazy eye, amblyopia, where I didn't have binocular vision. Um, I was um, 
not able to see depth perception or peripheral vision and went through like 10 years of vision therapy in order to um, gain normal vision. And so that experience really, I think, affected me going from seeing the world two-dimensionally to seeing it three-dimensionally. Um, that, that experience of going through that transition really affected the way I see the world and still continues to influence the art I make. Um, so I kind of took what you might call as a minor disability um, and, and used it to kind of influence my work. Um, and through that, I did a lot. I ended up doing a lot of research on visual impairments and um, other cognitive um, abnormalities and found um, just through my research, the kind of um, the condition of derealization, which I ended up titling the piece. And derealization is um, kind of described as an immaterial substance that separates a person from the outside world, such as a sensory fog, pane of glass, or veil. Um, what it actually is, it's a severe occipital temporal dysfunction in the frontal cortex that makes people feel like the world around them isn't real, like they're in a movie. And I've definitely felt that before, but I felt that these images kind of express that too. They kind of put me in this very strange dreamlike state when I looked at them and, or they represented that dreamlike state. So I thought that that's what, that's where the title comes from. It's, it's another um, kind of temporal, it's, it's another dysfunction of vision. And so a lot of my work was based around those kind of ab abnormalities for a while. Um, so really, um, I started embracing all of these kind of visual dysfunctions. You know, I was very embarrassed that I couldn't see right. You know, the um, visual impairment does really affect a lot of your other systems. And I, I started researching that and, and I found out actually that uh, binocular vision is the most complicated process that the brain undergoes. Your visual yeah. cortex is the largest part of your brain, takes the most energy. And most of that part of your brain is um, used in the binocular process, which means you're taking one image from each eye, two images, and turning it into one inside your mind. And that process ends up being the most complicated process that our bodies undergo. It takes more neural engagement. It takes more energy to do that. Yet um, we do it effortlessly without really knowing. Well, some people do. I don't. For me, it took a lot of effort. And so um, I found that to be profoundly interesting that um, this um, ability to just see one image out of two eyes turned out to be the most complicated function in the whole universe, actually, um, because our brains are the most um, powerful supercomputer that exists in the universe. And, and that function is the most powerful function in our brain. So, um, you know, most people take it for granted, but I didn't because I, I didn't have that ability to see because um, I didn't have two eyes that were pointed in the right direction. And one eye that was kind of pointed this way. So what happens is the brain recognizes that it's not seeing the same thing and it shuts off one eye. So I was only seen out of one eye and it took 10 years of vision therapy to be able to turn on both eyes. And I do kind of remember the moment that I was able to um, become binocular and it was pretty profound moment. It was like a light switch flipped during um, a therapy session with my vision therapist. And all of a sudden I could see normally and um, I'll never forget that moment. It was, it was a very um, inspiring significant moment in my life which is when you have when you have that big of a physical paradigm shift do you ever miss not being able to see binocularly well you know without my glasses it still kind of goes back okay. you know, if you squint and stuff you know you can kind of get a picture of it but um you know i wouldn't say i miss it but what i did is i really paid attention to anomalies like that and started really allowing them and mimicking them in my work. Um, I started um, using broken cameras to kind of represent, you know, broken eyes. 
and allowing them to take a little bit of control of the creative process where I wasn't as much in control anymore with my images I was taking because I was using broken cameras with light leaks. I started doing prints on expired photo paper to, you know, allow a lack of control. And um, all of those things really ended up successfully really giving me some freedom and it let go of my tight grip on control of the artwork and it gave it a little more of a, I think, a authentic feel that I could relate to because it's, you know, it's how I see the world. And, you know, it's very, very difficult to explain to somebody how you see. But I thought um, with kind of these um, practices, I was able to kind of show like, you know, I, I have impaired vision and so my artwork is going to be kind of using impaired technology or impaired tools right well and i i think in a in a show like transparency that direct empathy is something really powerful that art can do it can you know take something intangible like your vision which is different even for you and i right now and and you know place somebody in a different perspective absolutely um, and since i'm sitting here at museum of glass uh, the other thing i find really fascinating about your work is the role of glass as a mitigator, right? Like even right now, everybody listening to this chat, and or since I'm looking at the chat, Ian Grabinski and Shindo and your aunt Lily all say hello. But all of those people are watching this conversation and you and I are talking in a realm mitigated by glass. Yeah. And so much, it, it impacts so much of how we see. Uh, I would love to hear more about your your thoughts on why you work with glass and uh, what it means to make a camera out of that material. Okay. Um, well, you know, originally I was using the camera form as like a frame or a blank canvas that I would put my photographs inside. Um, originally I was taking layers of glass with Dimit, uh, with digital photographs, enameled or a decal layers and layering them into the camera. And so I just was kind of thinking like, oh, cool, the camera object, it's so recognizable. It's such a personal object that people hold and become very attached to. Each camera has a personal story. And so I was kind of taking cameras and putting those personal stories back into them using imagery, I was creating three-dimensional environments inside of them. So I was really, really using the camera almost as like a, a frame or a canvas. Um, and then when I realized that I could start um, using them as actual cameras, that they function, that kind of changed how I viewed the object that I was using. And I started thinking more about the camera as a metaphor, as, um, you know, it was a, a metaphor for the act of looking closely at something. It's the action of really looking and really learning and perceiving. And um, so I started um, putting the function back into the camera, allowing it to actually function. And so then what happened is the glass became kind of a medium for carrying imagery and I started doing very clear cameras that were almost people would be like, why, why just make a clear camera that it's just a replica. It doesn't do anything. And then I would have to let them know. I go, well, there's actually a little magic and mystery going on in here. And what I've done is I have taken away all the gears and mirrors and extremely technological computer chips that power digital cameras. And what I've done is, I've just used the most raw basic elements to capture imagery. And for me, that's pretty profound because without all of that technology, I was still able to just use a lens and a chunk of glass to capture an image, which is, I think, this incredible phenomenon to see. There's, there's something about um, taking a lens and shining light through it and you don't see anything. There's just what we call a latent image. The image is there, but you can't see it. But then when you put a ground glass screen in front of it, all of a sudden this imagery appears. And I know that's very simple, 
but that was kind of the point is returning photography back to its kind of um, original magic and mystery and showing, you know, how incredible and inspiring this phenomena is and um, hoping that it will encourage people to kind of reevaluate, you know, the process of filmmaking and photography and, and kind of um, recognize it for what it is, which is kind of one of the most important, inspiring pieces of technology that humankind has ever invented. Um, when you really think about all of the implications, um, they're far reaching. <laughs> and is that why in your work, the cameras that you make are, are more traditional and historic cameras? I mean, it's pretty remarkable that in a hundred years, it's become such a ubiquitous technology you know I'm, I'm sitting two seconds from my camera that's also my phone right you know um yes there is that um honestly i just find the vintage models the film models to just be more beautiful and you know i'm presenting them as sculptures and so if i was to cast a simple point and shoot camera it would just be boring but i um so that's one reason why i use vintage cameras but i'm also um, using a little nostalgia, and I, I am also talking a little bit about the digital divide that occurred in, in I'm of the generation where, you know, when I was beginning as an artist, um, we were all using slide film, and I was a black and white photographer, and I really, really loved just the craft of photography, the smell, and the dark room, and the process of making photos and developing film, and I found that there was a real different sense of attention to capturing images with a traditional film camera. You were looking through the viewfinder, you were bringing it to your face. You were much more connected in that moment of capturing an image than people are now with, you know, phones that are also cameras, but really they're not. They're, they're cameras, but people are just snapping away images. And um, it's been shown that majority of images people take with their phones are never seen again. They're uploaded to the cloud, they're deleted, they're never seen. Um, and so, um, although I have no problem with digital photography, I embrace it and I think it's incredibly powerful um, and love digital photography. But I, I find just, um, with the iPhone, it's taken away from, I think, that magical, the importance of taking an image. People just snap without even really looking what they're looking at. Um, and so it's, it's kind of taken away, I think, a little bit of the quality of image making and um, potential that it has. Um, not everybody, people still care. Um, but, um, so, you know, there's a little bit of that, a little bit of this in it. Um, I could go on forever talking about that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting when you uh, when you think about what, like, what is the purpose of having all these photos in the cloud? Like if we're if we're not capturing and reviewing a memory, why do it? Well, I guess what is great is you can go back. You know, that it's right. the thirty six exposure limit and throwing that out the window. You just snap away, and I have to say I do love going back into my cloud and looking at images I took six years ago that I never reviewed, and it, it's really wonderful that I don't have to have. Um, a limit. I can snap anything I want, but also having that limit, having that 36 film strip limit really made me think more about what I was photographing. And before I pushed that, um, you know, button, I really wanted to make it count. And, but now, you know, there's good and bad in that as well. You know, of course, without having that limit, you can not be so precious about things and just snap a thousand photos and potentially get a better one because we were able to take a thousand and choose that one that was right. So um, there's no hierarchy in it. There's advantages and disadvantages to both fields. You know? I Getting back to the work in the gallery, um, uh, Billy George on Facebook makes a really good observation that by changing the composition of the photos, in our display that's at the museum, it reads more like a film strip or a story. Is that something you think you're gonna continue to do? Yes, you know, I have for a while wanted to revisit this project because um, like 
the original one was done in 2014 and um, I haven't for some reason done a second version. This was just an unbelievably satisfying and successful project, which went a couple of years of taking portraits to get all the ones that I got. And um, I, I kind of finished it and left it there. And so now I am trying to find a new model and kind of, I will be revisiting this. Um, it's a huge amount of time and effort um, to, to get it to work, but I, I totally embrace that. And so I will be doing more and um, we'll see. We'll see what kind of format it ends up being. I'm gonna let it play out the way it wants to. I, I don't really know if it'll be a grid or a horizontal format, but um, I have to say, I really do like the horizontal format, the way it reads more of a book, flipping through a photo book kind of idea. Yeah, I like that. It, it also sort of loses the uh, the grid feeling definitely has a different, the portraits have a different relationship to each other when they're in a grid versus in a line. Um, and uh, so I'm looking at the chat, Josh, and comments and questions are pouring in. So if, you, if you're if you ready, I have some uh, shout outs and questions from our audience. Great. Um, let's see here. Uh, Hellos from Jennifer Morgan and Ian Grabinski and William Audley. Uh, Billy George has a question I'm going to read to you. Uh, it says, through the use of film camera, uh, the, uh, the use of film camera doesn't, uh, doesn't the time it takes to make the picture a parallel, uh, parallel to the handsome nature of you and the craft and artwork of your own work? Does that make sense? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, let me let me try it again. Uh, through the use of the film camera, uh, doesn't the time it takes to make a picture parallel tr to the way that you look? um part of the concept of your work so i think and billy you can uh feel free to ask it a different way since i'm butchering your question but uh i think maybe what we're getting at is how does the time intensive process of making these pinhole camera images impact the final photo yeah well you know taking a portrait is a pretty um personal experience actually um, some famous photographers, um, I read some quotes saying about how the portrait is the most difficult type of photo you can take, you know, because you are um, given the task of kind of capturing an entire complicated human being. Sorry for the sound. I live in a very industrial area with dump trucks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very difficult to capture an entire human in one photo and so successful portraits can do that but it's very very difficult um i think to have a successful portrait one that you know the person is happy with um and so there's this intimate moment that happens when when you're photographing someone and with this pinhole camera it was extremely intimate you know because we're in a dark room together or we're kind of, i'm kind of having to grab them and bring them closer and further away and then of course, there's this lack of control because of the blurriness, and so the photo comes out, and it might not be very um, flattering, you know. Um, whereas with a digital camera, you know, it's you know, with a flash and all the technology, you know, you can really um, craft it, and you can. Uh, I think it's very interesting what you can do with portraits. You know, you can really craft somebody in a way that maybe they don't see themselves, or um, you can show something about them that's more true. Um, so there's a lot going on with portraiture. Um, I'm not a portraitist. I don't do portraiture, but this was the first time I did it. And I learned how um, really engaging and um, satisfying it is. You can really, you know, I'm friends with a lot of the people that I um, photographed for this project. And it was a very personal moment. So I, I don't know if that answers the question at all, but, you know, <laughs> It's wonderful um, and amazing news. We've gone uh, international. Kate Rutecki says hello from New Zealand. Um, uh, your Aunt Lily would like you to know that she's drinking water from a glass that you made years ago. Um, and Ian Grabinski has a question. Uh, would you do another portrait series, uh, perhaps of LBGTQ artists? 
Yes. Um, or would you focus on random people? Well, you know, I don't know. After this whole experience, I am kind of inspired to do some work about, um, you know, queer culture. I've never done that before. And um, I definitely think that would be a, a great project. Maybe you can help me with that, Ian. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's also wondering if you could cast any type of camera. What would it be? You know, it would be uh, Panavision 35 millimeter. You know, if anyone's got 150 grand, um, wants to buy one for me, um, I would love to cast a Panavision. Um, I am starting right now on up my dream camera. It's a Hasselblad. It's a Hasselblad. Hasselblad is the most beautiful camera ever made. Excuse me, my cat is fussing. I'm going to get my cat out of here. Oh, it's about time. Come here, cat. We made it 31 minutes. This is Raina. Hi, Raina. Um, so I'm working on a Hasselblad, which is, I think, one of the most beautiful cameras ever made. Um, and it's also going to function really well for the portrait project. Um, I'm also really getting into working with um, eight millimeter film cameras. I'm a, I almost think film is more inspiring than photography, even though I'm really focused on film you know, still cameras. Um, I also cast film, cam uh, movie cameras, eight millimeters, 16 millimeters. And so I'm working on a 16 millimeter right now, or no, sorry, an eight millimeter that I'm extremely excited about. It's kind of a secret big project that is going to be the largest camera I've ever made. It's a commission for a wonderful um, film producer, actually, who contacted me and asked me, how big can you go? And so those are the five words that I've always wanted to hear from a wow. producer. And so I'm currently working on a dream project, which is a small, seconic, um, eight millimeter camera that I'm going to 3D scan, 3D print and skew it and, and work it digitally a little bit to morph it and then um, cast it in large scale. So I'll be taking a very small handheld camera and making something that's enormous. Wow. That sounds like a big undertaking. Uh, a question from Jabari. Uh, could making images with these objects you create be an attempt to create a shared experience of seeing with uh, of seeing the world the way that you see, which is so specific to you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, like I said, it's, um, it's kind of hard to describe how you see something. Everybody assumes that we all see the same way, but um, you can never really know how someone else sees. And I just think it's kind of fascinating um, to get, you know, wear someone else's eyes for a day and see the world through someone else's eyes. And um, I think that'll, um, you know, encourage some compassion in the world. If, if, you know, you can embrace your disabilities, if you can embrace um, abnormal ways of existing in the world and showing people through photography or uh, another means that, um, you know, you see things differently, but it's just as valid. I think that kind of starts a conversation of acceptance and, you know, people starting to realize that um, there's many different perspectives in this world and um, embrace them all. Yeah, I, I really love that. And I think it's a, a really important part of hosting the exhibition on our end is just, you know, to leave it at a first person narrative and and let each of the artists in the show share their own personal corner of the world you know and also not to hide your yeah you know show your scars you know show your faults and let them kind of define you and you know show you know it's what makes us unique you know or the or differences between us and so kind of um i, I think it's great to embrace embrace, you know, your genuine strangeness. Right, right. Um, and as a waiting for a couple of other questions to come in, but there are a lot of hellos to the cat. You so know, pass them along. The show, <laughs> wait, she's going to cause some trouble in a minute here. Oh, she, I see it. It's going <laughs> to happen. Um, Josh and I were joking for everybody listening about whether we could go viral with a good animal disaster. Oh, here's a, a really interesting question from Shingo. Uh, how have photographers responded to your work? Well, you know, a lot of times um, 
my collectors are photographers and I am really honored to work with them because they certainly relate to the work in a different way. I'm showing my work in the glass world and that's a little difficult because I get a much different reactions where people are just kind of like, why are you doing that? You know, like who cares? Like, are they just replicas or, you know? And um, I find it's a little bit more difficult to explain what I'm doing to the glass world and the glass galleries and the glass collectors. And then when I show and work with the photo people, they just kind of get it immediately. And they also have been instrumental in helping me kind of more clearly realize what I'm doing. Um, and also um, give me lots of work. <laughs> Photographers often contact me and will say, hey, you know, I have my grandfather's camera. Um, this is the most important object that I own of my grandmother, my grandfather. And by taking it and recreating it in glass, I'm giving it a new life and I'm making something very special, even that much more special. And then oftentimes um, through my digital image making kind of decal process, I can put um, portraits of those people who own the camera back into the object. Wow. And we're making these really powerful tokens, um, these very personal objects that um, kind of will mean a lot to people in very personal ways. And so to be able to do that, to make something that's so personal for somebody is a real honor to me. So I love working with photographers. Um, and they're always, they're always just giving me new ideas. Um, it's a big reason why I have stuck with this project kind of single-mindedly for quite a long time um, is just there's kind of an endless interest in it and um, constantly kind of tends to redefine itself and go, you know, I'm still working with the camera. There's so many different directions I've gone with it. That's amazing. Um, and another question from Ian, uh, have you ever considered casting a camera in multicolors like a rainbow? Or, and also, what's your favorite color to cast? Oh, Ian, yeah, no, um, I have done uh, multicolor cameras, actually. Um, I tend to go pretty monochromatic and tend to, um, darn it, cat eating my plants. Um, I go monochromatic and choose very toned down colors. Um, I'm not a really bright color person, kind of like melancholy colors. Gray, it's probably my transparent green gray. It's one of my favorite colors. Um, one second, sorry. Paul. No problem. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, people. Um, so yes, I, I've done multicolor cameras, but what that tends to do is it um, when you when you use a lot of colors, kind of distracts from the form a lot of the time. So I like to focus on the form, and I feel like if you have a very complicated form, simple colors. If you have a very simple form, complicated colors. And so that's just one, one rule of thumb. Um, uh, um, let's uh, see here while we're waiting for questions. Oh, I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about the foundry and you know where you're working and, and the other practice, practices you're involved with alongside this work. <laughs> Well, um, I got my master's degree at Alfred University, which has the National um, Casting Center there. And so I got really into casting metal, really translates to um, casting glass. And um, so I um, learned some basic foundry stuff. And then um, it really allowed me to kind of think more broadly about my practice. If I wanted to do something in metal, I could. I've been working with Artworks Foundry here in um, Berkeley to create really large scale cameras that are 3D scanned and printed and then cast in bronze. And so I'm working on, for the past couple of years on a really large uh, bronze camera that I've yet to finish. Um, I've also created the Glass Foundry here at my studio in Oakland where I have a casting service for other artists who want to realize their work in glass. So they'll um, come at me with projects, ideas, molds, and I will um, turn them into glass for them. So that's kind of my glass foundry project. That's amazing. Uh, and 
Hello to uh, Michelle, who is wondering where to find out more about you and your work. I would say the best way to do that is my website, which I um, revamped thanks to Katie Maslow. I love you, cousin. Um, she helped me put together a really nice website, www.hirschmanglass.com. And there are lots of um, insights about myself, artist statements, a pretty good portfolio of my work. And then you're also um, more than welcome to hit me up on social media and ask me any questions you have. Um, there have been a couple articles published about me back in the day in magazines, which are probably pretty outdated. Fine. Um, but, you know, I'm an open book. That's amazing. Um, and what? so where will your work take you next? Are you working toward a, a show or, you know, what's on the horizon for you? Oh, well, um, right now, um, this past year has been really difficult for a lot of artists. Um, creatively, um, it's been difficult. Um, I have been very lucky staying busy making work for other artists through the pandemic. I've been um, helping Oban Albright make molds. I've been cold working glass for Marvin Lebowski Studios, um, finishing some old masterpieces from, from Marvin's series that was actually made at the Tacoma Museum of Glass and um, finishing those unfinished pieces kind of. Um, and staying busy, um, doing commissions. Um, and I haven't really been making a lot of my signature works through the pandemic. I've been really focusing on helping other people, um, refining my cold working skills um, and doing the foundry work. Um, but now in the future, I'm focusing on probably the biggest project I've ever worked on with um, making a very large scale camera out of glass. That's gonna kind of push my limits in every way. And then um, what I'm most excited about right now is, I don't know if it's happening today, but sometime this week, my work is getting um, juried at the, um, oh, sorry for the sound. Welcome to my life, that's constant noise. But um, my work was accepted into the Toyama International Glass Exhibition at the Toyama Glass Art Museum. And so sometime this week, all of the most, just the curators who I respect most in the world are all in a room curate, uh, kind of during this show that I'm part of. And so that's what's really exciting for me is being in a museum exhibition, both at the, you know, Museum of Glass in Tacoma, but also in, um, in Toyama. And uh, the piece that is going to be in that show is very special because it's, they selected a Canon F1 which is a very iconic Japanese camp. Yeah. So it's very exciting to be showing that in Japan and very exciting to be in front of such this prestigious jury of incredible intellectuals who are gonna hopefully tear apart my work and um, you know have something interesting to say about it. But that opens, I believe, on July 6th. Um, so that's kind of what's keeping me busy right now is um, I'm, been dealing with some health issues. So um, the past, the recent few months and my future, I'm really getting my health in order. And it's been like this incredible journey of um, getting healthy, which has been extremely positive for me. That's wonderful. And I, uh, for everybody that's listening, I we have a few more questions uh, and, and it's kind of the last call for uh, you all, if you have anything you'd like to ask Josh. Uh, Josh, Vanessa is wondering if you ever do any teaching. Yes, um, I had a couple classes that were scheduled um, that got canceled because of the pandemic, which is unfortunate. And we are going ahead and rescheduling those, but we don't have dates. It's gonna be teaching a beginning casting class at DNL Art Glass Supply in Denver which Leslie, if you're out there, I love you. DNL Art Glass Supply in Denver, Colorado was really important to me early on. They gave me one of my first residencies and kind of helped me land my first gallery at Pismo Glass. And, um, you know, so I hope to be returning there to teach. 
Um, I also teach in my studio here in Oakland. I do flame working courses. I do casting courses. I do mold making courses, um, kind of weekend crash courses up to five day intensives. Um, I have in the past taught at public glass, but I don't have any schedule right now to do anything. Um, love to do an online class, but it's kind of, for me, more exciting to do it in person. So if, uh, if you would like to take a class from me, please, um, you know, go ahead and DM me on social media. And maybe if you're in the area, we can work out a private class. Um, I have a pretty great studio. I am also opening up my studio. I should put um, to kind of uh, community members here in the Oakland area, um, you know, geared towards kind of giving free studio space to BIPOC and LGBTQ artists who want to learn glass or have projects. I have a pretty open studio that I'm offering my kilns to. So if people have specific projects in mind that they want to do, um, I can help with that for free because I'm trying to kind of give back a little bit to the local community. I'm going to be inviting a group of youth into my studio to kind of give them a crash course on kiln casting, kind of a local um, local youth group. So those sort of things I'm really interested in doing, but I, do, I really do hope to teach more in the future. I've um, picked up a lot of kind of tricks and information that I, I, I'd really love to share with people. So if anyone's out there and wants to have me teach, I'm available and willing. You heard it here first, everybody. Um, all right, we have our, I think what's probably going to be our last three questions, or if you're hanging in there. Oh, so cute. Okay, uh, for, first of the final three, uh, Billy George is wondering, um, would you ever consider that the original grid of your images from the 2014 presentation reads as a photographic contact sheet? Yes. Uh, oh, cool. Yes. I, they were all originally printed on Polaroids. Mm -hmm. So when I made that composition and put them in, in that grid pattern, I was mimicking kind of the composition of a Polaroid, you know, not a perfect square, more of a rectangle, like a three by four. Um, and so that was kind of the reasoning for that grid um, is just, I love working with Polaroids. They're incredible. The, the, just that format of photography is just so great. And it's so hard to find Polaroid film now. So I was kind of honoring that square, that square of the Polaroid um, composition with that. But, um, you know, I, I think the contact sheet is actually a pretty good thought. I, I really like that. I, I didn't go there originally, but I, I think that reads, I think that's pretty ridiculous actually. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and uh, Chuck Taylor says his regards, uh, and he's wondering if you'd ever be interested in making a kaleidoscope. Well, yes, you know, of course, you know, um, telescope is more what I'm interested in. I find telescopes to be a little bit, I mean, kaleidoscopes, maybe a little kitschy. Maybe, um, although I love them, it's something you might see in a gift store. And I, I don't want to affiliate my work with anything that's too gifty. However, optically, they're so interesting. You know, it has, it has, um, Cross my mind, but I don't have any intention of making kaleidoscopes at this time. Uh, and our last uh, audience question comes from uh, Judy Granley Gates, uh, who's wondering besides your work, uh, what other glass artists inspire you? Well, um, some of the photographers who inspire me um, is Gregory Crudson, he's a contemporary photographer. And if you don't know who he is, absolutely, if you're into photography, you have to go check out his large format photography. Um, he's one of the best photographers in the world. And he happens to be my friend's cousin, happens to be Laura Donifer's cousin. Wow. <laughs> really inspires me. I love Laura Donifer, but she is going to one day get me into his studio in New York. Um, another artist that's really inspired me is um, Laszlo Maholi Nagy. Um, he did some really abstract e experimental light based old photography back in the day that was groundbreaking in the Bauhaus. And um, it's not a glass artist, but he was doing, um, I think work that is still kind of ahead of its time. 
using um, photograms and really just simple methods of light work to create abstract imagery. And that, that inspired a lot of my, my photo-based work. Um, glass, glass workers who inspire me, um, all of that. I'm such a nerd. Um, I really love um, Levinsky and Brachtova are my favorites. Um, Daniel Clayman, um, Clifford Rainey, Oben Albright. These are artists who I think are really pushing the limits and really um, doing stuff that pushes me to make work that's kind of really thought provoking and, and more than just a pretty glass sculpture. Um, so thanks to all of them and more. I mean, there's so many artists out there. Um, Tim Tate. Yeah. Well, and speaking of Tim Tate, um, we're excited to be including him in the exhibition. Uh, and, you know, before we wrap things up, I just want to say uh, thanks so much to you, Josh, for sharing so much of yourself in your work uh, and for allowing us to have this really fascinating conversation. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>